suitably, suitably refreshed, fed and watered. Um, for those of you who didn't meet this morning, my name's Phil Green, and I have the privilege of being your track chair this afternoon. Uh, that's why I'm sitting, because uh, the chair has to be kind of attached to the chair, and if I stand up, you won't hear me. Um, this morning, if, can you show of hands, who was in here this morning in track three? Oh, quite a lot of you. And, and that's interesting, so just observing to our speakers that here in a conference which has technology in the title, it's rather heartening to see so many people whose interest is in the human performance technology and in getting closer to a, a shared understanding of what it is that works and what it is that achieves results within organizations. Uh, this morning, we heard the stories of Charles Jennings and Sarah Frame, and um, those were our... Now we've got three experts telling relevant advice to um, borrow Rogers' words again, but we've two stories. And um, I'm not going to read to you the CVs of our three speakers because you can find that, the detail of that, the words, on the Learning Technologies Conference website. But I will just tell you that Collectively, we've got more than 36 years of experience here, and that's just me. Sorry. <laughs> and and, <laughs> and that, that's what we have. Tim Druitt, who's uh, on, my, on my far left, who's going to speak first, is an e-learning specialist from the law, firms, Eversh law firm Eversheds. And um, uh, Tim, on his own, can claim 17 years' experience in learning technologies and um, uh, will be revealing during the things he says to us some of the things that he's been doing recently. Um, Keith Stopforth, who's um, on Tim's right, uh, is Head of Talent and Development for Bupa Europe and North America, and uh, is a passionate L&D specialist. And alongside Keith is his colleague, Claire Shell, who's EHR consultant for the same organization, Bupa Health and Wellbeing. And they're all very welcome. So, Tim, okay. over to you. Okay, yes, my name's Tim Druitt, uh, e-learning specialist at Eversheds, and I'm going to spend about 25 minutes, all being well, uh, uh, on the subject of learning that works with the business and explaining how we've used e-learning to promote learning development in Eversheds and actually achieve results and a lot of buy-in. So that's the overview. That's You've seen that in your uh, conference notes, so we're we'll looking at identifying and targeting the business need, but quickly. Um, how the meaning of quality can differ between the executives in your organization and us in L&D. And I warn you now, the purists probably won't like what I'm going to say at this point. Um, I'll talk about how I worked with subject matter experts to grow their authoring skills so that the subject matter experts, the partners in our organization, felt comfortable to move forward with the learning technology strategy and to embed learning into the workplace and to really buy into this whole way of learning. Building credibility through the successes that we saw and then driving change um, by leveraging those achievements. So that's the synopsis. Quick comment there about Eversheds. You can read most of that for yourself. Uh, one of the UK's largest law firms with a global presence. Um, we don't do um, personal law. It's, all, it's corporate, sort of business law. And some of the awards at the bottom there and the one I can partly claim credit for is the FT Innovative Lawyer Award winner for 2010. We submitted four entries. Uh, the e-learning one, we came second in our category by one mark um, for law firm efficiency. Um, but overall, our uh, four submissions uh, were top. So the FT gave us the Innovative Lawyer Award for the year. So we're very pleased about that. OK, so identifying a target needs quickly. So the starting point, probably a lot of those things are very familiar in your organization, uh, regardless of what sector you're in. But the world of law is changing rapidly, so we need to have the most knowledgeable, client-focused lawyers out there. Um, equipped to advise on the latest legal developments, and you'll see that a lot of our e-learning has been around taking our new legal changes, legislation, and embedding that into the workflow of our people. Sharing the expertise of our colleagues, a lot of wealth experience. We've got some very talented um, lawyers in the firm, and how do we leverage the knowledge that they've got uh, to impact the business, um, our lawyers, we want them to understand the client business, so we've got to work on their skills in feeling affinity more with the client, and then leveraging the full capabilities of the firm. Law firms typically work in practice groups, so you might be in the human resources practice, in the real estate, but as a firm, we capitalize on the fact that 
So a lot of our clients have projects that stretch across lots of different areas, and it's always like cross-selling internally. So through our learning development, key to the business need was allowing the lawyers in one practice group to understand what the others do so that we can network better internally and what we call um, network law, um, offer our client solutions across the different um, spectrums. So that was the key business need, the starting point for us. Who are our champions? Uh, we have, I call them surrogate trainers. They're our professional support lawyers, and you'll hear me use PSL, that's what that stands for. Uh, they're our in-house legal consultants. They are all practicing lawyers, but they don't practice uh, with clients. They advise internally. Um, so they, they primarily focused on technical content. Um, we are technical legal trainers and trainees, legal advisors, and partner education. So they look at the, the students coming in, the graduates at the start, and as they work through up to partner level, the PSLs, are the, sort of the trainers supporting that cohort. We have our risk and compliance team. Being a law firm, that's important for us. So they're a stakeholder in using learning technologies. And the partners, if you think Evershed, we have 350 partners. That's 350 business owners, um, all running their own little area. A very key, important champion, because at the end of the day, it's their business that they need to perform, their team, that obviously gives them their um, earnings at the end of the year. And we needed them to champion employee development, but also I needed them to convert... Um, to become enthusiastic um, e-learning champions. And finally, at the bottom, uh, we have about five, six of us in the central learning development team, and we have a role to play in all of this. So it was a targeted beginning. This journey started about, well, two years ago um, when I joined the firm, and it was where we, had to, where we started. It had to be very targeted. So as I say there, I actually went where the appetite was the strongest, so where there were the most pressing needs, the simplest of requirements to get started, didn't want to try too much too soon, uh, where we could see clear measurement of the results um, in the eyes of the stakeholder, the end user, and and, and D, and also going where least resistance could be found. So those stakeholders that were more um, eager to be the, the keenest early adopter. Uh, so rather than sort of flogging a dead horse somewhere, actually looking to see where your early champions would be. And what I did to start with um, was took an existing classroom training session um, that had been run very success successfully by our real estate practice group and converted that into an e-learning module to show that they wouldn't lose anything that they would have had in the past in the classroom when delivered through e-learning. So it was a very targeted, very small beginning. And those first steps were very high touch. Um, identified two uh, professional support lawyers, PSLs, um, who had an immediate project. Uh, one was in real estate, one was in litigation. And we really focused on developing something very quick, fit for purpose, to prove that learning technologies could have an immediate impact. Kept it simple. And really the emphasis at that point was on ease of creation. And you'll see later um, when I talk about how we built the skills of the subject matter experts that I wasn't concentrating on day one on making the partners, the lawyers, uh, instructional designers, because that would have scared them off. Um, so there were a few guidelines to hinder. So it was trying to make this as simple and straightforward as possible. It gave me a chance to learn their business as well, because um, I wanted to, to um, win them over to trusting me as a trusted advisor to them. And by starting with those two small projects, uh, we could look at some very targeted initial evaluation, uh, just to test the water, make sure people were comfortable with this way of learning. And again, with my experience, 17 years, uh, gut feel that it was going to work, but we needed some early validation from first target groups um, to reassure the PSLs that this was the way forward and jointly share the success. So this is the bit where purists have to look away. Um, I'm probably not a purist, actually, although I've been involved in lots of e-learning projects that have got very high instructional design. Definitely over the last two, two and a half years, I've realized that actually a quick and dirty can be very effective. Um, we have to think about, in our way of life, fit for purpose and, and ready for business is what I call it. Um, I've been guilty in the past of working on projects that take so long to develop and deliver that by the time it's launched, the business has moved on, and the world of law is, is, is constantly changing. Um, we have a very intelligent target audience. Their time is limited. Um, you probably know billable hours, culture, that sort of thing. And to be honest, they were impatient with lots of the instructional techniques that we've used in the past. Um, and for, the, for a lawyer, they're really keen about how I put the learning into practice in the job, and so the focus had to be on the on-the-job on the application to really facilitate that learning transfer. And luckily, in a law firm, if you're familiar with uh, Myers-Briggs, ISTJ is the typical Myers-Briggs profile 
of a lawyer. So actually the subject matter experts and the target audience did actually share similar personality type and learning style. Um, so maybe we didn't have to go too outside the box when it came to techniques. I call this the new order, the old order. Uh, the old order was we use building blocks. Lawyers want it straight to the point. Neutral examples, they want us to be specific. Everything you ever wanted to know, no, just tell me what I need to know to do the task. Do you want experienced facilitator? No, I need a credible subject matter expert. Voiceover artist, um, all our e-learning has voiceover. Actually, no, we just want to hear a colleague who's really done it, talking about it. And well-researched content, yeah, but actually we'd rather prefer the real-life stories of our experts. So how did we grow the SME's authoring skills? And I call it there, turn them on before you turn them off. <coughs> So I needed to understand who that champion was going to be, the champion that was going to embed this learning into their business area. Um, they were experts in their field. I'm not a lawyer, so I, could, I had no starting point. They had very clearly defined outcomes. They know exactly what they need in their business at any point in time. They know what law's changing. They know what client work they've got in and to marry the two together. Very time limited, as I said earlier. But there's a wealth of existing material, not just in their heads, but in various paper resources and online resources that we have within the firm. Key, and one of them actually said, Tim, this rapid e-learning, if I need to do a look at a manual, I'm not going to do it. So I had to actually put two guidelines I'd done for developing webinars and developing e-learning modules to one side. I had to hide those for a few months because I got a clear message. If it's not easy, we're not going to do it. They were, although, open to being coached by a credible guide. Hopefully that was myself. And clearly they weren't ready to be an instruction designer yet. So that's actually the step-by-step, -step. Um, and I said you do get these slides afterwards, and this has actually evolved over time. I didn't set out for this to be the model. This is the model that involved. We do use quick e-learning modules, so rapid e-learning. Oh, I should say, we call them quick, because rapid in <coughs> Ebersheds means something else. So um, if I say quick, it's actually rapid e-learning. And webinars um, as well. We started in both cases with quick and dirty, taking a basic slideshow that already existed, put it into Articulate, which is the tool we use, and just pushed it straight out, narrated the slides, end of story, that was the first few modules. Um, and for all the reasons I said, because it was a subject matter expert speaking, the content was very direct, the lawyer who was giving it knew what the end user wanted, it went down really well. Then on the quickie learning, I call it quick and dirty, but with finesse. So that's when I started to say, okay, you've got an awful lot of text here, can we look at this in a different way? Could a graphic tell the same story? You've got 150 words of some case law here. What's the key bit? Oh, it's only the middle sentence. Well, let's just focus on the middle sentence. They don't need to know the rest. So we started to take slides in from such a matter experts and just sort of tweak them to make them better. Then I introduced the concept of using questions as a learning tool. First of all, for self-checking, but then actually just asking a question to generate the learning itself. Only then, when the partners and the such matter experts and the PSLs were getting into it, they go, okay. What else can we do? How else can we, you know, I'd like to learn a bit more about this instructional design thing. Only then did I give them Tim's guide to doing an e-learning development um, project. Because that's, they had the appetite then. They'd seen the early successes. They were ready to improve their own skills. We then introduced interactions. And Phil was part of this. Uh, joined in one of our first train the trainer sessions for PSLs. Who at that time were actually champing at the bit to learn more about uh, how people learn. And finally, we're up to the stage now where they're actually devising their own blended learning solutions and quite sophisticated in some ways and quite surprising actually how they've taken to it. With webinars, very similar. We started quick and dirty. Just read your slides um, to the group. Then we put in simple interactions, yes, no buttons. Uh, then I did actually introduce a webinar development guide quite early on to give them some ideas of the other things you could do in a virtual classroom, such as polling, Talking to people, asking people to unmute their lines and have a conversation. You can actually talk to people. Using text chat, desktop sharing, and literally a couple of weeks ago we started down the road of using breakout rooms to show that you could send lawyers off into small groups, get them to uh, talk about something and come back and present. So it was literally very drip by drip, step by step, taking them from quick and dirty to some quite advanced. In fact, one of the PSLs yesterday, I was doing an audio record, um, she actually express more interest in learning more about virtual facilitation. She said, that's the way this is going. I, I really want to be a better... And she's actually very good. Um, she wanted to go that extra level. And that's a lawyer asking um, for that sort of training. Key learning points for SMEs, and I'll share these with you. And again, I've looked at these over time. Chunking. The subject matter expert has a big idea what they want, and they want to give everything to everybody, especially in the world of law. So over the last 18 months in particular, and we're getting there, um, we're now chunking content. We started with one-hour modules, 
two years ago. Now we're down to 20-minute modules and getting shorter. So the, the lawyers, they're understanding that they can break their content down to smaller bits. The need to know versus the nice to know. Thinking about modules, not the course. Um, not forgetting what you did in the classroom. Um, that's still important. And using questions as a learning tool. I think that's a, a great technique. Looking at the pre-existing resources they've already got, a lot of our professional support lawyers actually create what we call precedents, which are internal guidelines on how we interpret the law vis-a-vis uh, -vis client uh, matters. Um, so it's how you leverage all that material you've already got, so encourage them to think about that and not to create from scratch. Moving from telling to guiding the learner. And famous one, you're probably familiar with this, copy of the slides isn't necessarily the handout. And that's actually the next piece of work I'm going to do. Um, this year is actually create another handbook on how to create an effective um, handbook or workbook to accompany your webinar or e-learning course. So building credibility through success. So I wanted to leverage those early wins by gaining the partner buy-in, and so the partners are key in our business. Um, the PSL adopters, the early ones um, in litigation and real estate, were bought into it. They saw the success. They were generating more and more content that way. Um, so I wanted them to have the confidence started to work with their key clients, because often a PSL, they know about the subject, but they know that there's another partner, another associate um, in the firm who has better knowledge. So they started to ask other lawyers, other partners, will you join in the project? Will you provide the subject matter experts? The PSL will guide them, tweak the content, um, but then I would actually record the session with the, um, the author. And that's where it really started to take off, because the partners were being involved in these projects for the first time, enjoying it. Obviously, the first project they had was being directed by the PSL, but some of them said, actually, I've got other things I want my team to know about. Can I have a meeting? Can, we just, can I show you some slides? Can I come back next week with my own? And can we create some more modules together? Um, so that's how it really started to grow, uh, with part, more and more partners saying, I want that, I want that. Um, famous examples of video, we use video in some, and other partners hearing that somebody else had been videoed. Well, I want to be videoed. I've got a message. Um, so again, they were buying into the method, having seen the results. got to the tipping point uh, for us when we realized that this was something it was embedding in the business. The business was really taking to this. And that was a third practice group, company commercial. Um, they'd been watching on the sidelines. They hadn't been one of the early adopters. But they were looking. They were showing the best practice. They were seeing what the others were doing. And in the back of their minds, they were starting to, to plan ahead. And literally, they came to me uh, a year ago, September, and said, right, we're taking our entire due diligence diploma program that was uh, days in the classroom. It's going online uh, with a blend. We want exercises and one-to-one -one coaching before and after. We've got the slides all mapped out, and we came up with this 14-module um, program that spread over a few months. They had very high expectations. The predecessor event, this diploma, had been very successful. They really started to push me as well on the capabilities of the tool. They'd seen what the others had done. They said, I'm sure it must be able to do more. I think it can do this. And can we do that? How do you do that bit in the classroom online? You know? And so they really started to push me and making me think. And they actually came up with a well thought blend. And we've just launched uh, with Company Commercial an 18 session or webinar program on corporate finance law. And again, that's a big leap for them. So over the next uh, 36 weeks, um, a team of 40 um, lawyers are going to be uh, trained. And that's very important. We, we, we did a, a hire in of a very talented a corporate finance lawyer from the States. He's building a new practice, and he's got 40 lawyers, and it's all in his head. But over the next 38 weeks, he's going to disseminate his fantastic knowledge through webinar program. So starts, uh, the pressure starts to get to us. Uh, we're under more pressure to resource all this. Demand is increasing exponentially. And more and more PSLs are coming out of the woodwork, literally. I didn't know some of them existed, um, but they started to pop up with their own requests. L&D, we're having lots of time issues, and projects were, started, and projects were taking longer to complete. Um, one of the PSLs actually took a leap of faith and said, you're so busy, Tim, um, but I've got so many modules I want to do. Can't I have the tools? Can't I have the technology? So we actually bought um, one of the real estate PSLs, a laptop with the Articulate software, a set of um, microphone headphones, and she's off now doing her own material for her practice group. Um, the others, PSLs, are still thinking about that. Um, then we did the trainer trainer, which Phil took part in. Um, development guides have gone out, so people do know a bit more of the material for themselves. We now have a best practice sharing forum, so the PSLs regularly hear what's, what's good and great and what hasn't worked. And we actually recruited a new L&D team member uh, who joined in September. And uh, 
Victoria, half of her role is helping me host webinars and create e-learning modules. And the demand is just so strong. Driving change, 2007-8, the bottom. These are approximate figures based on interviews with the PSLs about how they were designing and delivering training. Big shift you can see there, the data speaks for itself, from a classroom and compliance e-learning to a much broader spread. And a quite a domination of um, webinar and, and e-learning modules have really taken over. Um, the way we deliver a lot of our legal knowledge training now it really has embedded. And the word mobile appears there, and we'll come on to that in a second. So return on expectations is important. There's all these things about ROI. I'm not sure it's a whole conference in itself. But the early tactical win showed the business that it did what it promised for very little outlay. In the medium term, I showed the organization, company commercial, that we could stretch it. It could do more challenging things. It could take a previously successful diploma program and take it entirely online. So it was flexible. And in the long term, as we upskill our subject matter experts, it's more and more going to underpin what we do to support our knowledge and business change. So that's how we permeated into the mainstream. We started small with the e-learning modules. We started off with some targeted training around the trainees, trainees coming in. Uh, then we went to practice group refreshers around content. Firm-wide induction went online a year ago. And now we're going into product and sector group and some core diploma criteria. That statistic at the bottom is now way out of date. It's about 150 modules, I think. But in 18 months, we created 120 of our own e-learning modules. Webinars, we went the other way. We started with a large-scale webinar, so broadcasting to the masses. Then we brought it into trainee training, uh, product and sector group education. And now we're getting to the stage in company commercial where small groups, 12, 15 people on some of their other diploma programs are coming together in webinars to discuss and review material. And this year we saw a five-fold increase in our webinar usage, so that was significant. Okay, work-life balance. This is where we go into mobile. Um, two years ago, I always thought mobile learning glint in my eye. always wanted to do it, but didn't really think it was right to, to major on that. But actually, uh, the business is asking for it. Um, we've got no shortage now of content that we've created, created in-house. What we've heard, though, is that people find it quite difficult to study the desktop. That's probably no different for most of you. You know, the lawyers, when they're at their desk, they're doing client work. And it's actually the lawyers, the partners, started to say, look, I've got a BlackBerry, I've um, got an iPad, can't you put this stuff on here? So um, we're about to kick off, about to select the vendor in the next couple of weeks, um, a BlackBerry pilot. Um, we've also started to do podcasts as well, but we couldn't put those to mobile devices because you're not allowed to plug your iPhone, your iPod into the work system, so we're going to use the BlackBerry that way. So we are going to launch a mobile learning course, put our podcasts out through our BlackBerrys, and also we do license some video clips from an organization, so we're going to put some of those out there to test the water to see if that real pent-up demand is there. I actually feel, based on what I've, conversations I've had with some of the practice groups, that a lot of our learning in the future will go straight to, to mobile. It'll bypass the desktop altogether. because Our lawyers are traveling a lot, and they're asking for it, so that's good. Okay, last slide there. And that's, these aren't my words. Um, I mentioned the award we went for. We had to have two external referees. Um, and this is uh, Laura Overton from Towards Maturity, agreed to be one of our referees. And she's been following what we've been doing at Eversheds for the last 18 months. And those were her, part of her uh, testimony to the Financial Times. And that concludes my presentation. That's my email address do please uh, contact me. And as is so common nowadays, there's my Twitter <laughs> details as well. So if you, if you want to tweet, um, feel